so today we're going to talk about, well, first, the FEM uh, deep dive. Uh, this is uh, basically, it's going to assume some amount of understanding of both WASM and IPLD, uh, and then talk about how we use them uh, in the FEM. So the FEM is the uh, Filecoin virtual machine. It's the virtual machine uh, that we are uh, now using in uh, the Filecoin network. At the moment, it only has built-in actors, and these are all built in Rust uh, and then compiled to WASM. Um, in, in the next milestone, uh, we're going to be adding uh, EVM support by actually running the EVM inside WASM. Uh, and then the milestone after that, we're actually going to be allowing people to deploy any WASM-based actor they want, so they can deploy both EVM and WASM actors. Uh, one of the fun things about the the um, or about Wasm and about the FM in general is that like because it's Wasm and you can compile a lot of things to Wasm, you can actually just compile other VMs to this and run it on top. Uh, so for now, it's the EVM, but in the future, we can add additional ones. Uh, and basically, Wasm is a great target if you just want to be able to run anything. That was our main reason for using it. So this is the architecture. Um, there are a lot of components here, but uh, I'm just going to go and walk through this. Uh, so at the very top there, you can see the, the executor. Actually, let me quickly back up and talk about Filecoin for a second. So Filecoin is a blockchain. Um, as a blockchain, it has blocks. Uh, these blocks have messages. Uh, the messages are also called transactions in some chains. Um, and to sort of get the state of the next block, you take the state of the previous block, you execute all the messages, uh, and then you get some new piece of state. And that is like the new state of the world. Um, that's the general idea. But Filecoin is a bit tricky because it has tip sets, but that's basically the idea. Um, here, you can see this executor. Uh, this executor will live for the uh, lifetime of a single block um, uh, and sort of like handle all the message execution within that single block. Um, uh, within that, uh, we have a machine. The machine kind of keeps track of all of the state we have uh, related to that block. So like we initialize this machine with the current state tree, the block store, some externally implemented functions that are implemented by the, the Falcon client, um, uh, and anything else you might need there that's sort of like common across all messages. Uh, then for each message, um, we have that message execution section you see there, um, where basically uh, the, uh, we start processing a message. The executor uh, creates this thing called a call manager. Uh, the call manager is uh, how we manage the call stack, uh, where like you, you have like basically a message comes in. We need to then send it to the first actor that receives it. And the first actor can send it to the next actor, send it to the next actor, send it to the next actor. That's what the call manager deals with. Basically, it receives a message. It sends it to the first actor, which gets run in thing called the invocation container. Um, uh, that executes the, the, the WASM actor internally. Uh, then um, this message, well, really, the actor can call back out through something we call a syscall uh, into what we, something we call a kernel. That um, uh, actually is kind of like the, it's the host side glue that we have uh, for, uh, for these actors. Um, from the kernel, they can access their state, uh, check their actor ID, like do all the, the fun things they want to do on the blockchain. They can also call into other actors. So there, um, basically, you, you start in your invocation kit or in your WASM actor, you call in through a syscall into the kernel, and they say, hey, kernel, I want to send a message to this other actor. Uh, that then goes through the call manager and gets routed down to, like the, basically, the call manager will then create the next um, kernel and then load the next actor and sort of repeat that down. Um, and you can, as you can see, this diagram is kind of repeated along. Uh, for each message, we'll do the same thing, um, create a new call manager, and just we're in the same process. And then when we're done with the block, we'll move on to the next block with a new executor, um, uh, and everything starts all over again. Um, at the very bottom there, you can see an engine. This is just a very, it's a common way of dealing with WASM, where like you have some caching engine that can cache your WASM or your WASM modules because they can be expensive to compile. Uh, but this is the general architecture. Um, I made this in case you're interested in contributing to the code. <laughs> Please do. Uh, but this explains how this works in general, because if you just jump in the code, it's very difficult to understand. Um, yeah, that's the architecture. I, I'm going to talk about it, some specifics of how we use IPLD. Uh, one is we use it for sending messages. Um, so like when you get a message from off-chain, the parameters are an IPLD block. Uh, this, this block cannot link to other things, because you're off-chain, you can't copy state that way. Um, On-chain. Uh, when you send from an actor to actor, you can send an arbitrary IPLD DAG. You can actually say, like, here is this tree of data that I have. Take it. The other actor can then do whatever wants to the tree of data, and then it will turn another tree of data back to you. This is really cool because, like, uh, in, in a lot of blockchains, I can just send, like, serialized state, and that's it. Uh, but I can't give access to parts of my state tree. 
With Filecoin, we can do that. I can literally like unhook a part of my, my state uh, and just give it to you. You can then do whatever you want with it, uh, mutate it or just read it or whatever and send it back. So for example, like, like instead of like making a bunch of calls into an actor to like try to read state and understand what it's doing, I can just say, hey, what is the current state of your registry? It just sends me its registry. I can't modify it because it's all copy and write, it's IPLD and immutable, but I can still go and modify, like, I can look at it and do whatever I want there. And if I do want to modify it, then basically I go and edit it locally, send the edited version back, uh, the, the target actor have to then check to make sure, okay, is your edit sane? Does this make sense? Are you allowed to do these operations? And if it is, if it is then they would, they would save it. Uh, so this is just something that's really cool that's just not possible to do in any other system. Um, yeah, so that, that's the message side of things. Um, for working with IPLD, um, this is somewhat important because like dealing with like, basically working or crossing the WASM boundary is hard in general. Uh, so we have to think a lot about how to make this work reasonably well. Um, the, the basic, effectively we have three read functions and three write functions uh, in, in uh, the FEM. Uh, when you start out with, or when you start out, uh, you have to first ask the system for your root object or for, for your root node. Uh, the, like the, your root is your state root. Uh, and you do this via a syscall, the what we call a syscall, but in many systems it's called a host call, or basically you, you're calling out to the system and saying, hey system, please give me my root CID. The way this works is actually you, you pass a pointer into your memory and ask the system to write the CID back to that address. It's annoying, but whatever, it works. Um, once you have your root CID, then you can quote unquote open it. This gives you a handle, like a file handle, uh, to this, this um, uh, to your root block in your state tree. Uh, it also tells you the codec and the size, so you can decode it. In the FEM, we decode everything in the actors, so basically in user space. We do this for a couple of reasons. One, performance, actually, uh, because if we did this in the kernel or like in the system, uh, then there'd be lots of calling back and forth between uh, the, the actor and the system, the actor, the system, the actor, the system. Uh, the other performance benefit is like, if you know the shape of your data ahead of time, because like, you've compiled something that knows the shape of the data, you can sort of skip, you, you can optimize your decoding, uh, assuming that shape of the data, and if the shape doesn't match, then you just you fail, you abort. Um, uh, so like that's one of the other reasons. Finally, it's like by doing all the stuff in the actor, we have better security because if we did this client, if we did this sort of in the FM itself, then if some actor puts malicious state, that could cause us to like run out of memory or something like that. By doing this in the actor, it's everything's nice and sandboxed. Uh, so yeah, we we then open the block, we then read it. We have this as two steps because when we open the block, we don't know the size, uh, and we also may not read want to read the entire thing. Uh, so this lets us basically like in a file system, you open and then you load the data. Uh, then you have a little circle thing. Uh, basically, we sort of rinse, repeat. Uh, so like once we've read the root block, we can start decoding the, the, the substate, start loading children, um, working with it. Uh, and then when we actually want to save something, we create the block. Um, uh, so basically we say, hey system, here's the codec I want to use, here's the block. The system will then validate that this is a valid block. It also does some other validation in terms of like, I'm only linking the state that I'm allowed to access. Uh, we have to do some, we have to be very careful here so that you can't just like uh, access state that's not a part of your state tree. Otherwise you'd have non-determinism, other not so good things. You'll get back a handle. And then finally you will, uh, given the handle, you will create a new CID and tell the system, hey, please make the CID for me of, of the state. Uh, and then you can finally set your root to the root CID. So that's kind of the life cycle where you, you, you get the root, you open, start opening blocks, start reading blocks, and you can start creating blocks, linking in blocks, and then finally setting a new root. Uh, to give an example of, of how we actually use all this, um, this is the uh, multi-sig state definition uh, in the actors. Uh, it's just a struct. Um, it encodes to IPLD, but really we just specify as a struct and then say, hey, yeah, encode to IPLD. Uh, in Filecoin, we want to be really, really efficient. Uh, so we don't encode this as map, we actually encode it as an array, uh, where basically we encode it as an array of, of fields. Uh, and it makes it fairly efficient. It means that it's a bit difficult to understand without using like a, an IPLD schema. Because an IPLD schema can say like, hey, like here are the fields in this object, but without a schema, you just get a set of fields. But on the other hand, it's with Seaboard, it's actually very efficient. Uh, and unlike, for example, like an EVM, it's still typed and structured. Uh, so like even if I don't know what the fields are, I still know all their types. I can still like decode it without having like a type definition, and I can still work with the data somewhat, which is really convenient. Um, yeah, and then in this case, you can see at the bottom, we have pending transactions. Uh, uh, this is um, uh, like linking to a, a hamped of, of uh, transactions or a sharded map. Uh, uh, and this is also one of the powers of IPLD is like you can decide where your block boundaries are and like where your data boundaries are. Uh, so like basically reading the state is one big read. 
uh, where like an EVM, you have to read a bunch of little things, which uh, m like like basically every one of those will sort of have the full read cost. In this case, you basically have sort of like read like basic read cost and then a per byte read cost. Uh, but if you have group state, it's really convenient, so you can just kind of like read blobs as they're like related to each other. Uh, and then, then you can go ahead and like pull out a transaction that's encoded in a separate object and referenced by CID. In this case, we have a transaction. Uh, that really is it for the FVM. Uh, like that's how it works. It's actually not too complicated. Uh, the complicated part uh, will come next with like how we get the EVM working with it, how addressing works, how users will use these things, all this kind of stuff. A lot of this stuff is still very much up in the air and work in progress. Um, uh, so I'm not gonna present it right right now. Uh, but the basics of the FEM and specifically how it uses IPLD and WASM is just, it, it's actually fairly straightforward. Uh, I guess the next step is any questions? Um, so the EVM is like uh, going to be a virtual machine on top of the FEM? Yes. Um, yeah. And then other virtual machines potentially? Uh, yes, ideally. Uh, so so the, the way this works is yeah, basically we can we can take a, any virtual machine we want. Um, we can compile it to WebAssembly, uh, and then we can just run that as an actor or as an actor runtime. Uh, uh, but one one of the fun things about the the FVM is like so like if an EVM um, when you deploy an actor or a contract, you actually like you copy the code each time. Uh, so like you say, hey, deploy this code. It will then it'll run your init code to produce more code and it stores the code next to the actor, but this like duplicates a bunch of code and means like deploying new actors is actually somewhat expensive. In our case, you can make really big actors like the EVM uh, and then just like keep on deploying new copies of this VM uh, and it's basically free because we just point to it by CID. In, in the EVM, they have a workaround here where they can, they can deal with this by using what are called uh, proxies uh, or basically like you, you, in the EVM, you would deploy your heavy actor to some like common address and then like everyone would sort of deploy their, their other actor and have that proxy to this common address. This has some security concerns though because like you're basically delegating to this common, this common actor uh, and if the common actor is not safe or like, like someone else controls it, then like any, like th that the controller can sort of change it at any time. With content addressing, you can't do that. Um, yes. Uh, for EVM, do you use exactly the same group of machines that are already um, for the EVM, we're still experimenting. Uh, I think we were looking at Sputnik. I can't remember the latest version we're looking at, uh, but basically it needs to be in Rust, um, uh, which makes it somewhat tricky. Um, yeah. Yes, yeah, like we're not using Geth or, or the Go EVM or anything like that. We're using a Rust VM. But yes, we can just basically take a Rust VM and come out with Wasm. Okay, then I guess I can add some addendums here where like, uh, uh, in like in future versions, uh, because like, one one of the things about the Wasm target uh, is that the most languages will compile the Wasm. So I'd love to actually be able to like transpile EVM bytecode to WebAssembly, and you get much better performance that way. The problem with running the EVM inside WebAssembly is you're going to pay a performance penalty. Uh, but uh, but on the other hand, you get like we can get like exact compatibility here, uh, where we can actually like literally take. Uh, well, that's getting some extensions here, I guess. I was focusing more on the IPLD stuff, but I guess I, can di I have a lot of time, so I can dive in a little bit to uh, even compatibility. Uh, the plan here actually is to support sending messages uh, uh, from off-chain uh, as actual like Ethereum messages, uh, and then processing them on-chain using an account abstraction somewhat uh, like the one proposed for uh, the Ethereum blockchain. Uh, uh, this means you can use like MetaMask or whatever tool you have uh, to just like uh, take basically create messages, send them to the Filecoin blockchain, um, uh, and then your sort of like your EVM based account on chain will then process these messages, validate the Ethereum signature, and then forward them on chain. Um, and then you should be able to use all the addressing and all of the, all basically all of the standard tools uh, on, on chain as well. Uh, the other cool thing is like uh, we're going to be implementing the, uh, or at least a part of the Geth API. Uh, so you should be able to use all your same off-chain tools as well. Basically, you'll just pretend that you have an EVM node uh, and follow the exact same, uh, or really an ETH node, follow the exact same flow, uh, and you have to deal with 30-second block time instead of 10-second block time. Uh, but other than that, like everything should just work the same. And then you also have access to all of the um, to all of the built-in actors, so all of the the, the, the existing like storage stuff. Uh, so that's the the general interoperability story there. Um, 
yeah, that's, I guess, uh, does anyone here want to talk about uh, how we do instrumentation? Um, or I can move on to the next talk. Is there, is there any interest in like how we like do gas accounting and stuff like that in Wasm? Or stack? Yep, okay. I just didn't want to, it's like this is an IPFS audience, not a, a Filecoin audience, so I just wanted to check. Uh, so like the, the uh, okay. Uh, so one of the fun things about Wasm, uh, I don't know how much people have dug into like the details of how it works, uh, but like it's, it's highly structured. Um, uh, so if you look at the actual, like the byte code, uh, it has actual, like, actual blocks. Uh, so you can see like loops and blocks and function calls and all this kind of stuff that they're all in the Wasm. So you can actually like look at it as a sort of computation graph. Uh, which means it's very easy to like uh, to decode and to annotate and to to instrument. Uh, so like uh, we basically we're doing the same thing that um, uh, what's that group uh, that I think Parity did. Yeah, um, uh, we're basically we go through your Wasm code and for every block of data before we run the block of data or sorry block of, data, block of code before we run the block of code uh, we basically uh, charge for gap the the gas that, that block of code code will charge. Um, and then we also check your stack depth and we say, like basically have a running counter of your stack depth and like we know how much stack this function will use. So we just charge, for, or not charge, we actually just like account for that up front. If you run a stack, we just cancel your, your, um, your message. Um, uh, if you run out of gas, we also cancel the message. But the cool thing about this is it means that like we can insert this into your WebAssembly code, uh, then compile it, then run all the optimizers and stuff. Um, uh, so the gas counting is actually very, very cheap. Um, it's not super cheap, but it's, it's pretty cheap um, because like it can actually get optimized, and we also don't have to like we don't have to use like every, something for every single instruction. Instead, we can kind of account for entire blocks at a time. Um, in the future, actually, we would like to get even better at this. Uh, so like right now, um, we we account for every single block sort of up front. In theory, you can actually sort of you can be a little bit more loose here, where you can count for like an entire function uh, for or really for multiple paths of code, and sort of over account for multiple paths, and then refund at the end of the paths. Um, this allows you to actually avoid. Uh, a lot of jumps and checks and stuff like that, uh, because in, instead of actually having to like check to see have I run out of gas, you check to see if you will run out of gas up front, charge for everything you could use, and at the very end, it's a very simple add instruction to 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 uh, like rebate, uh, but that just becomes very cheap. The other cool thing here is that you can actually charge for gas charging uh, as part of your your gas charges, uh, which is something that's somewhat difficult to do in other systems, or that you can like charge for the gas charging instructions or charge for the 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 um, uh, the you can even account like charge for the the uh, stack accounting functions, uh, which we can actually encourage people to write better or code that optimizes better for gas accounting. Uh, so this is one of the really cool things about Wasm. Yep. We do you charge for space storage? Uh, we, because like we PM do. has this plan over there of like having multi-dimensional gas, or basically they count ah. differently for different. I would love to do that. We don't currently do that. Um, yeah, that's actually one of the biggest beats with gas right now uh, is that it's one dimension, but it's wrong because like the gas dimension is time, state storage is an entirely different thing. Um, uh, we actually have one major benefit in Filecoin in that we are a storage network. Um, uh, so like like we can't store live state in in the Filecoin uh, network because like we need to be able to access every single block, but we can like we can probably store a dead state uh, or not dead state, but like sort of iced state. So like if we have or actors get frozen, it, once we finally figure out some way to do some kind of rent thing, um, uh, like in systems like Ethereum, like it's, it's, like it's somewhat difficult to do this because like someone has to have the state and has to be able to resuscitate it. Um, in something like Filecoin, one thing I really would like to do is just say, fine, every single storage provider has to store the entire state, like entire historical state. It's not that much data. I mean, it's, it's a lot of data, it's terabytes, but the storage providers store like petabytes at least usually. Um, or at least hundreds of terabytes. So it's actually not too bad to just say, fine, if you are a storage provider, you have to store the historical state, and you have to be able to sort of bring it back online, um, uh, which I, don't know, I think is really cool. Um, but yeah. Uh, how do you estimate like, how we count the specific web assembly instruction? I mean, that's supposed to specific So at the moment, we charge an average, uh, which is not good. Uh, but we're doing this because we're only running um, user, or sorry, like built-in smart contracts. So we're not running user-specified ones. Uh, so like, uh, you can't actually securely charge an average, which means we have to like go and, and and do more analysis there. Because if you charge an average, then someone will just find out something that's really expensive. For example, when we were doing this analysis, we found out that uh, random memory reads are really expensive. Uh, computers are designed for op uh, computers are designed for optimized code. Uh, or sorry, optimizable code, they're not designed for pessimistic code. So like basically in a blockchain, you can throw away your caches 
uh, those don't help you with security. Uh, you could throw away like all of your, your um, uh, branch prediction, all this kind of stuff, uh, because an attacker will just like find the code that is the slowest possible code uh, if they want to, if they want to slow down your chain uh, and try to get you to execute that. Uh, so what we're going to have to do actually is, uh, is basically charge, like, so one of the nice things about WebAssembly though is like it, it now has this bulk read instruction. So what we can do here is we can charge like a uh, sort of a read offset uh, uh, or sorry, it, a, some amount for the random read and then some amount per byte uh, because per byte is cheap. It's just the random read that is expensive. It's the latency going to memory. Um, for other instructions, it's not too bad uh, because most instructions if it's just like any kind of math or branching or whatever, that's not terrible. Uh, but we still need to do a lot of detailed analysis of this and we haven't done it yet. The other thing we've actually noticed is I, I we think it's the instruction cache, but we're not entirely sure. Uh, we noticed that jumping back and forth between WebAssembly and, and system is, is like, it's not super slow, but it has a fair amount of cost. Um, uh, and we, we believe that's because it's trashing instruction caches and stuff like that. Uh, so that it's, it's one of the more annoying things because like anytime you want to get something out of the system, you have to sort of jump into, into Rust and jump back. Um, uh, we would love to see this optimized more, but it's like you just have to charge gas for, gas for right now. 